Welcome, brothers and sisters. I'm glad that Jesus is the only name we need to know and that I know him. And more importantly, he knows me. Well, no, it's not more important, but thank God he does know who I am. And uh, boy, we say some dumb things sometimes, don't we? Here I am, just got up and already, boom. But uh, be in prayer for me, as Pastor said. Uh, the Lord has been dealing with me about this message for several months, uh, but he had to preach it to me first. And if you preachers understand what I'm saying, uh, if the message doesn't work in our hearts, we can't expect it to work in the hearts of those that hear it. And I'm glad that God is a personal God and he allows us to learn. I'm glad that he has mercy, Amen. grace, and that he's long-suffering. Amen. Amen. And uh, how many of you have been frustrated lately? How many of you realize it's only going to get worse? Yeah. I was holding out hope with a few others in the world system, thinking that things might change, things might go back to the way they were, but I just got to stay with the Bible. It's not going to. I'm just going to stick with what the Lord said. He's coming soon, and I'm looking forward to hearing that trumpet. And I praise the Lord for it. Would you turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2, please? 2 Peter chapter 2. Aren't you glad for godly examples? Our pastor being one of those. Amen. Amen. You say, why do you exalt pastor? Because he's a man that follows God, and I respect that greatly. Amen. He doesn't want the recognition. He doesn't want the uh, kind words, if you will, because he's humble. But I believe he truly walks with God, and I look up to him. Amen. And I praise the Lord for that. I've never had a pastor like him before. And uh, so, thank you, pastor. And I'm not trying to upset you or anything, but I love my pastor. And I pray for my pastor, and I'm so glad that God brought us here when he did. Second Peter chapter 2, if you have your place, please say amen. amen. <clears throat> Verse 4, the Bible says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after, that after should live ungodly. The next two verses is where we're going to concentrate tonight. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I come to you tonight unworthy. I come to you, Father, in complete need of you to help me. Lord, I'm just a messenger. Father, I have your holy word before us tonight. But, Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit to work in our midst. Lord, I need you to guide me through the Holy Spirit tonight. Father, I pray that I would not say anything in and of my own strength or my own will, but Lord, whatever I say tonight would truly bring you honor and glory and that you would work in our midst tonight. Father, we are seeing your word come to pass just as you said things would happen. Thank you, Father, that we can trust you. Thank you that you have given us what we need to know for the times that we're in now. Father, as we look at this man named Lot, Father, help us to examine ourselves. Father, help us to look at our own lives and not compare ourselves amongst ourselves because that's unwise. But, Father, help us to compare ourselves with your precious Holy Son. Father, may Jesus be lifted up tonight. May he be glorified. Father, I pray that you would draw men unto you. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that's not saved, Father, please work in their hearts. Draw them to yourself. Lord, help them to call upon you before it's everlasting too late. While we don't know how much time we have left, Father, Lord, help us to make the best of it for your honor and for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. A while back, the Lord impressed on my heart to do a comparison between Abraham and Lot. And, of course, we know Abraham was a godly man. Yes, he had sin. Yes, he told lies. Uh, but the thing is, as we look at the hall of faith, we find Abraham. 
And we find out that he pleased God. In fact, God said some good things about Abraham. We'll get that in a little bit. Try not to get ahead of myself. But Lot grew up under Abraham. Abraham took Lot under his wing. Lot was able to experience the blessings and the riches of God in his life while he walked with Abraham. In fact, he got so blessed and became so rich that there came a time that they had to divide asunder and depart their ways. And when we think about that, you know, the splitting was because of strife, because Lot would not force his herdmen to yield themselves to the herdmen of Abraham. Uh, but that came from his leadership. That came from him being selfish himself. And we'll learn a lot about that. But as we look at these verses that we're at right now, if you'll go back to these verses, uh, looking at verse 8, the only reason we know Lot was saved, that he's in heaven, is because of these verses. Not because of the accounts in Genesis. By all means, we would wrongly assume if we only had the accounts that were found in Genesis, we would say that he was a lost man. There's no way he could have been saved. Because a lot of times we, we base salvation on the works of people. Uh, but that's not the way God works. Aren't you glad about that? But thank God for these verses that let us know that he, he was a just man. But he vexed his righteous soul. He was innocent in the eyes of God because he had trusted in God. Obviously, he came to believe in God under Abraham or maybe even before that. But the Bible declares that he was just. But we look at his life and we say, how could he be? Wait a minute. Would people declare us to be just looking at our lives, the way that we live? Our actions, do they declare righteousness? Do they declare being just or do they declare something else that gives a wrong message to those that observe our lives? And we've got to be very, very careful. Too many times, I know early on in, in the ministry, I, I was very judgmental, very uh, prideful. Uh, but God knows how to humble. God knows how to get our attention. God knows how to remind us, hey, uh, I think I was merciful with you. I think you can be merciful with other people. And I thank the Lord for that. And I don't like the woodshed. Do you like the woodshed? No, I don't like it. But I'm thankful for it. And it gives me great testimony from the Lord that I'm his. Amen? And, and I praise the Lord for that. But when we see what he was doing in verse 8, he was dwelling among these people. Now, he remember, he was with Abraham these years. He observed the way that Abraham lived. He knew how to live right. But he ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah first by casting his eyes towards those well-watered plains of Jordan. And when Abraham came to him and said, look, we've got to divide the sun or things aren't working out, I'll let you choose, Lot, which way you want to go. Instead of Lot saying, no, Abraham, you need, you need to make the decision, Lot said, okay. And he went by his sight. And he looked at what he thought would be the best for him, not the best for Abraham or anyone else, but what he desired, that's what he went after, and he chose the well-watered plains of Jordan. Then he cast his, or he pitched his tent with the opening facing Sodom and Gomorrah. He was heading down the wrong path from the, point that he, from the very point that he decided that he was going to separate from Abraham. Instead of trying to uh, you know, make things right when the herdmen were fighting and, and, and Lot saying, look, Abraham, I respect you, you're my elder, you know, uh, our herdmen were wrong. We'll just yield to whatever you, you need or want. That's what we should do, by the way. We should still respect our elders. We should still respect those that had the authority over us. And Abraham did have authority over him because he had taken him under his wing to, to take him along this journey that God had called Abraham to. But instead of getting things right, Lot said, okay, let's separate. And then he chose what he thought was going to be the best for himself. And I want you to understand something. Satan still paints sin in a beautiful picture. He makes it look so enticing. He makes it look so wonderful and beautiful, but we're not looking at the whole picture because he'll suck you in through your own desires. He'll suck you in through uh, your own vain lusts, and he'll have you to make wrong decisions based on your feelings instead of what's the right thing to do through your own desires instead of yielding to those that have the authority over you. 
But here, instead of Lot doing the right thing, he be continuously made wrong decisions. He continuously went down the wrong road, not only looking towards this wicked area, not knowing that it was wicked, or maybe he did, I don't know. But then he pitched his tent towards it, and the next thing you know, he's dwelling among these people. Now, we know from the scriptures that Sodom and Gomorrah was a very wicked place. Yeah. We know this. Amen. Now, he had been with Abraham. We can't lose sight of that. He knew a righteous man. He knew a man that lived the right way before God, yet he chose to dwell amongst the wicked, a just and righteous man. Did it have an impact on his life? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And not only was he dwelling there, but he observed what they did. He saw it daily. Did it have an effect on him? Yes. Do you realize the things that we see, where we live, who we hang around with, that will affect us in one way or another. The Bible still teaches separation. The Bible still teaches that we should be separated unto God and separated from the world. And it makes a difference, the decisions that we make in our lives. And every decision we make, no matter how important we think it is, will affect us. And therefore, we must seek the Lord in everything. And it's easy to say. I'd love to tell you every day I seek God's will. Now, I'll say it with my mouth, but what do my actions do? What do my actions do? So... He not only dwelt there, he lived among them, which why would a righteous man want to live amongst the wicked? Because sin is pleasurable for a season. Sin does have an enticement to it, right? If you, des if you deny that, you're denying what the scriptures teach. But then he observed them, he watched them, he saw what they did. That should have gripped something inside of him and something should have been screaming to him, you need to get out of here. And then he heard about their unlawful deeds. And the Bible says they were unlawful deeds. And whether it was the person that he was with talking about their own unlawful deeds or them describing the unlawful deeds of others, all these things had an impact on what? And it wasn't for good. He stayed there. Shortly after he separated himself from Abraham, these foreign kings came into Sodom and Gomorrah and overtook it. And they captured a bunch of the people and all the riches, all the substance of the people, and they took Lot with them. And when Abraham found out about this, he didn't say, well, that dummy, he got what he deserved. I hope he learns his lesson. He didn't do that. He gathered up an army of his own men, and he went after these captors, and he delivered Lot, and he delivered those people of Sodom and Gomorrah and their riches. And he brought them back. Not one time do I read where Lot said, Thank you, Abraham. Not one time do I see Abraham or Lot saying anything to Abraham about being rescued from these captors that came and took him and all that he had away from him. And when he brought him back to the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, the king says, Look, just give me the people. You can keep the riches. Abraham says, I don't want any of it. I don't want anything to do with it. Just the food that my men consumed. That's all I want repaid. But Lot continued dwelling in Sodom and Gomorrah. And, of course, God goes to deal with Abraham about the promised seed that he was going to bring uh, from him and Sarah and praise the Lord from that. And next thing we know, Lot is there in Sodom and Gomorrah. But the two angels from the Lord, they, not only did they come to visit Abraham to give him the good news and give Sarah the good news, but then they pondered, the Lord pondered whether he should share with Abraham what was getting ready to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. And as we think about it, they finally told Abraham, listen, we're going to destroy the city. And Abraham immediately began to plead for souls. Think about this. Abraham knew Lot. He knew that Lot knew the truth, right? He knew that surely Lot, because he knows the truth, that because he's in Sodom and Gomorrah, surely there's going to be righteous people in that city. And wouldn't we assume the same things? Don't you expect a Christian that moves away and moves to a different place to have an impact on their, their place that they're living, to tell others about Christ, to do the best they can to try to win people to the Lord? Isn't that what you would expect from a Christian to do? A person that is a believer? That's what we ought to be doing. We should make the places that we go to better places and share the great news of a, of a loving, merciful, long-suffering God. 
And so Abraham begins praying, and he says, Lord, if there be 50 righteous, will you pray, please not destroy the city? God says, okay. Abraham says, what about 45? All right. 40? 30? 20? 10? You know, the last number that Abraham gave the Lord, 10, he said, surely at least Lot and his family are, are righteous. Surely enough of them are righteous where you won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. You won't destroy the wicked with the righteous. And by the way, that's a great picture of the church being raptured out of here before destruction. Because God will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Hallelujah. But here, when Abraham pleaded 10, what was the result? Did the angels change their mind and go back to the Lord? No. They continued on their journey to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now remember, Lot was saved. He was just. He was righteous. And the only reason we know that is because of the New Testament. But when those angels of the Lord came to his house, he recognized them immediately. Isn't it funny? Listen, if you're saved, you're going to recognize the Lord right away. You're going to know God's trying to get your attention right away. And as we think about that, they came into his house. He, they said, hey, get you and your family ready. We're going to take you out of here because we're going to destroy the city. Well, while they're talking to him, here come the men of the city, the Sodomites. They wanted to have their way with the two angels of the Lord. I don't think I need to get into any other details of what they're going to do. But they desired that. <clears throat> and Lot finally stands up and says, do not this wicked thing. He knew what these people that he, were, he was dwelling among, he knew what they were doing was wicked. He knew it. He saw it. He heard it. He vexed his righteous soul. But here, when the two angels of the Lord came, now he say, hey, guys, don't do this wicked thing. But these guys said, who is this guy that came to sojourn with us trying to tell us to quit doing wickedness when he's seen us do it all along? Christians, we lose our testimony. We ruin our testimony when we start partaking of the things of the world and we allow these things to go on unchecked. We don't open our mouths. We don't say, hey, this is not right. And people have no respect for us when we do start saying, listen, this is wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. Because they watch our actions. They watch what we do. And as he is talking to them, and as a, I can't believe what he did, but listen, when you're in sin, there's no telling what you're going to do. Sin will take you further than you ever imagined away from God. And it costs a whole lot more than you ever thought you'd ever pay. And we hear that cliche, but it's true. It's so very true. So while these men are beating down the door of Lot's house, trying to get to the two angels of the Lord, Lot tells them, don't do this wicked thing, but then he does something that is absolutely, I can't understand it. He says, take my two virgin daughters. You can do whatever you want with them. No way. No way. I'm not going to say what I would do, but it wouldn't be nice. I would definitely not offer up my children, but again, here's a righteous man living in an unrighteous city, participating, whether he's actually doing the things himself or not, he's watching, he's hearing, and he's not rebuking them when they're doing it, but now that they've come to his house, you know, isn't it amazing the attitude amongst Christians, amongst Americans, is as long as it's not affecting me, I don't care what goes on? Hello? As long as it's not personally affecting my life, you, you do what you want, just leave me alone. I think that was Lot's attitude. Hey, you guys, go ahead and do what you want. Just don't bother me when now they're at his house knocking on his door. And now he's doing unfathomable things, offering his own daughters to these perverse, wicked men, knowing what they would do. Knowing what they would do. I don't understand it. I don't ever want to understand it. I don't ever want to be put in that situation. But when we think about it, Finally, the men said, no, we want these two angels of the Lord. Or the, they thought they were men, but they said, we want them. And they started to break down the door, and finally the angels cursed them with blindness. And then they tell Lot, listen, who else is here? You need to get them. Tell them, let's go. Let's get out of here. So he runs to his sons-in-law's house, and he tries to warn them. And according to the Bible, they perceived Lot as someone who mocked, a hypocrite. One they couldn't trust. 
He tried to warn them, destruction is coming. Was destruction coming? Oh, absolutely. He was telling the truth. But because of the lifestyle that he lived, because he was there, and obviously his son-in-laws were living there, so he didn't warn them about those lifestyles. He didn't tell them, listen, these things aren't right. He allowed them to marry his daughters. Now he comes to their house and says, hey, now we got to go. God's going to destroy things. Whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? Well, the wickedness of this city. What wickedness? You live amongst us. You, you see what we do. You know what we do. Well, God's going to destroy the city. We need to get out of here. Basically, he appeared as a fool to them. Remember, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. A fool will deny the things of God. And a lot of times, Christians, if they're not living for the Lord, they're going to appear as a fool. They're going to appear as one who doesn't know God. And then when they start speaking spiritual, righteous things, they're not going to be believed. And as far as we know, it was just Lot, his wife, and his two daughters, and they had to be drug out of the city. They had to be taken with their hands in the hands of these two men of the Lord, these two angels, and they had to be drugged out of the city. And as they're going, the angels warned them, listen, do not look back. Don't look back. What happened to Mrs. Lot? She looked back. God turned her to a pillar of salt. Now, we think about that. The Bible doesn't give us information how Lot reacted. But I don't see anything where he cried out in woe or anguish. I don't see anything where he says, oh, God, please have mercy on my wife. Why did Mrs. Lot look back? Because her heart was back in that city. Lot was obviously not living right before his wife. She enjoyed the things of her home there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Her livelihood, her, her life was being destroyed behind them as the angels were drawing them out of the city. As you think about this, she was turned to a pillar of salt. And finally, we see Lot pray for a city not to be destroyed. Finally. What city was it? Well, it was the city that he wanted to go and dwell in. It wasn't outside of Sodom and Gomorrah in that area. It was still in the area. And he asked the angels not to destroy that city. And they say, okay. They won't destroy that city. Again, God's protection over his children. Amen. God's protecting them, not allowing destruction to come upon them. But they go to this city, and remember, Lot, he knows right. Then he ends up in this city with his daughters. His daughters get him drunk. Let's just be honest about what the Bible says here. Let's just look at it for what it is. How many parents will consume alcohol with their children because they want to be cool to their children. Do you think God was against being drunk at this time? I mean, it's after the flood, remember? God wanted us to live righteously. God always wants us to live holy and righteous. But here, Lot is. He's drinking alcoholic beverages with his children, his daughters, and they get him drunk. What kind of example is that? You don't hear much preaching on this anymore, do you? What kind of example, first of all, for parents to give their children this vile drink of alcohol, but then to get drunk with them? And if only that was where it stopped. It wasn't. Then he had an incestuous relationship with his oldest daughter. Did he know what happened the next day? I, how could you not know what happened the next day? How could you not know? He didn't rebuke his daughter. We don't see him repenting before the Lord. Lord, I, I, I don't know how this happened, but Lord, please forgive me. He does know how it happened. He didn't seek repentance from the Lord. He didn't seek forgiveness. He didn't rebuke his daughter. And that very next day, what happened? The younger daughter did the same thing. Yes or no? Wickedness. Wickedness. Brought about from ungodliness of a person who knew the Lord that wasn't living for the Lord. It will have an effect. It will have eternal effects. Eternal. That we can't change. Only God can change the lives of people who get caught up in sin. And so then we see two nations born out of these children that were born from an incestuous relationship who were enemies of Israel in the future. See, it just continues to snowball downhill. It continues to snowball. And again... We don't hear a lot 
about Lot after these few chapters in Genesis other than what we read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, that he was saved. And I'm glad that he was saved. But how many people died and went to hell because he was not being who he should have been and he was definitely not talking about God like he should have been talking about God? His own family, his own children, his own wife, son-in-laws, his daughters that were with the son-in-laws, they obviously didn't go either. They were destroyed. Abraham pleaded for ten souls, at the very least ten righteous souls. Please don't destroy them amongst the wicked. And God said, okay, if there be ten. I really have to wonder if there was only one righteous person in Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe it was Lot himself. But what a sad testimony for a person who claims to know God. Now, it's easy to condemn Lot, is it not? It's easy to point out his faults and say, well, if he hadn't have done this, he hadn't done that. But how many times do we find ourselves listening, seeing, participating in the things of this wicked world? How many times do we see ourselves acting selfishly, not caring about those around us or those that we need to be concerned about, those that have the authority over us, you know, him not giving Abraham respect when the herdmen were fighting and him not rebuking his herdmen for fighting with the herdmen of Abraham. He should have done that. When Abraham gives him a choice, he should have left it to Abraham to make the choice for him. But he didn't do that. A lot of pride going on. You know, pride is a great indicator of sin. A great indicator of sin. And as we look at these things, all these things were taking place and just snowballing effect and getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, God has to drag Lot out of the place that he was in, all because Lot wasn't following God. Isn't it sad that we have to drag people who are Christians away from sin? Isn't it sad that we find ourselves hearing, seeing, maybe even participating in the things of the world that we have no part in? Now listen, we're in the world, absolutely, but we're not of the world. We should be different. We should be more like Abraham. And as you know, the Lord impressed on me to, to study the difference between Abraham and Lot, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to come out more like Abraham. Well, that was prideful. That was wrong. Because if we're not careful, we could be in the very same situation as Lot. And we can sacrifice our children. See, I want you to think about this. Later, Abraham also sacrificed or was going to sacrifice one of his children to the Lord, the promised one. He had the knife drawn. He was getting ready. Man, I love Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. Whew, what a chapter. But Abraham is getting ready to pre pre present Isaac, his only begotten, according to the promise of God. He was about to offer him as a sacrifice, a burnt sacrifice unto the Lord. He had the knife getting ready to slit his throat. And the angel stopped him. He says, now I know you fear God. And it just so happened, he heard this bleeding of a ram over in a thicket. See, on the way up, Isaac was no dummy. Here's the wood. Here's the fire. Where's the offering? And Abraham smartly said, God will provide himself an offering. The Lord Jesus, amen. amen. He is our lamb. Amen. Slain from the foundation of the world, but even slain on the cross of Calvary. Amen. He was the one that God was going to offer up for the sins of all mankind. Our Melchizedek, a priest forever, sacrificing himself, and, and he... He gave this challenge to Abraham, and, and I tell you what, I hope he never asked that of us, or me. But the thing is, Abraham was so trusting in the Lord, maybe he figured he would raise him up, maybe he figured something else. But Abraham was willing to do exactly what the Lord said, and at the point that he was about to do it, God said, all right, stop. Think about that. He was willing to offer up his son to God, Lot, was willing to offer his children to the devil. 
and to those that live for the devil. Abraham was a praying man. Abraham, when the angels came to him, I want you to think about this. Now remember, Abraham had already rescued Lot from being captured in Sodom and Gomorrah. Did that wake Lot up? It should have woken Lot up. Hey, wait a minute, something's wrong in my life. Why did God allow me to become a captor or be captured by the enemy and everything taken away from me? God was trying to get his attention. But he didn't learn anything. And again, I didn't read anywhere where he was grateful to Abraham for rescuing him and giving him back the things that he had. But now, when Abraham receives the news that Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be destroyed and Lot's in that city, Abraham didn't say, well, go get him, Lord. He deserves that. Abraham immediately began to pray for the souls, the righteous souls, to be spared. Did Lot ever pray other than praying for the one city that was even still in that area of Sodom and Gomorrah? He didn't pray for people like that. Not according to what the Bible teaches us. We should be praying people, should we not? Shouldn't we be praying for the benefit of others? Shouldn't we be praying for God to, to help those that are uh, not living right for the Lord? We know that they know the truth. We know that they uh, believe in God, but they're not living like they should. Shouldn't we be praying for God to deliver them? Yes or no? Ye that are spiritual, restore such a one. Amen. Right? Amen. We should be praying for restoration instead of condemnation. Amen. And so many times, we as independent fundamental Baptists, we're too quick to shoot the wounded Amen. instead of trying to get them healed. We should be praying for one another. We should be praying for that next generation. Listen, moms and dads, our children watch us. What you see here... It's something you only see on Sundays. My wife, she sees me every day of the week. Amen? She knows my ups and my downs, my good and my bad. God gave her a long-suffering spirit. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. I say that laughingly, but I'm serious. I thank God for my wife. I thank God for him and his long-suffering and his mercy. Because we can become such boneheads. Knowing the truth, knowing that, listen, this ain't right, you shouldn't be doing this. But yet God is merciful. And God reaches out his hand still. And he'll even drag us away if he has to. To get us to the place where we need to be. Thank God for that. Thank God for his mercy and his grace. You know, when Abraham stood before the Lord, I'm sure he heard, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't think Lot heard that. You know, when we all stand before the Bema seat, those of us who are saved, when we stand before that Bema seat, I believe there will be weeping. I believe there will be great shame for the times that we should have done better and we didn't. Because we will be judged by what we did, not for entrance into heaven, but for rewards that we receive that we'll be able to represent to the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the one worthy to receive those things. And how many people will be standing in heaven saved but their hands are empty. They have nothing to cast at the Lord's feet. They have nothing to present to the Lord because they were saved and that's it. And there are lots of people like that. There are lots of people like that. Salvation is not the finish line. Salvation is the beginning point. And we are to live holy. Be ye holy because I am holy, saith the Lord. We are to come out from among them, says the Lord, and be ye holy. Amen? But those that we hang around, those that we allow our children to hang around, and moms and dads, please take note of this. You know, the idea comes across, well, if you let your child hang around my child, then maybe they'll influence them for good. Well, the truth is they're going to influence your child for bad. And the battle is not going to turn out the way you thought it would. Be very careful who you let your children hang around. Be careful who you hang around. Now, you may be in the sanctity of your own house. You may say, well, this is my house. We can do as we please, but your children are watching you. I can't imagine the things that Lot did with his, his daughters. Why would he even allow them to drink in his presence? Why would he drink with them and then the things that took place afterwards? I can't fathom that. But listen, when you're so far in sin, there's no telling what you'll do. But by the grace of God, we could be in the same situation. 
but by God's grace and His mercy, we could be talked about like Lot's being talked about right now in a negative way. And it's not that, you know, he didn't do those things. It's not that we're making it up. It's forever written in God's word. This is what he did. God never hides sin. God never covers it up as far as trying to say that it didn't happen. But he does cover it up with the blood of Jesus Christ when we confess it. And I, I think about this tonight. I would ask you to consider your life today because when I look at America, you know, America is a picture of Lot in my opinion. We've had the truth. We've walked in the truth for years. But now we've gotten away from God. And we look at what is taking place in our country. It's becoming Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's only a matter of time before they come knocking on your door, wanting to know the people in your house the way they wanted to. Because the, the powers that be today are unfettered. And they're power hungry. And they're going to do anything and everything they can to go against what God has said do not do. You look at the wickedness of our nation today. We should not be where we're at today had we stayed faithful to God. The nation that forgets God shall be turned into hell. You're seeing that come to pass in your lifetime. Our children are going to experience worse things should the Lord tarry his coming. And I don't want that. But we're seeing the results of those who know the truth. They even know God, but they're not living for God. That's why judgment will begin at the house of God. Because we are more accountable. We know the truth. And we need God to help us to take the rest of the time that we have left and do the best we can to be that warning to the world and share the good news with them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when that trumpet blows, it's going to be too late for those that have heard the truth and have not received Christ as their personal Savior. It's going to be too late. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If people were to look at our life tonight, if they were to base their decision about God on the way that we live, would they choose to seek God or would they choose to reject God we're the only thing for a lot of people that represents God to them you could say that we're like a walking Bible to them and they're gonna wrongly judge God based on our actions are we different from them do we live a separated life to where they can see God in us or do they see themselves in us? Well, you say you're a Christian, but you're doing the exact same things I'm doing. You say I need to get right with the Lord, but we're doing the exact same thing. Why do I need to get right with God? Yes or no? And this is where we're at today. This is where our nation's at today. And I'm thankful that God delivered Lot. I'm thankful he drug him out of the city and he didn't destroy him with Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'm thankful he's not going to destroy the church with the world Amen. hallelujah we deserve to be but we're not going to be because of him because of his grace because of his mercy and tonight I don't like this message at all I'll just be honest with you because it hits too close to home but I need this message and I hope that you need this message as well we really need to examine ourselves if we'll judge ourselves we should not be judged is that not what the Bible teaches us? And that's what we need to do. America needs to judge itself. And God is the only one that can give us hope in these days ahead. He is our hope. And while we're looking forward to the trumpet, we're going to experience some things. There's no doubt about it. We're going to have to make some decisions. And we're seeing that daily in our lives. Are you ready to make those decisions? See, Lot wasn't ready to make those decisions until the angels of the Lord were in his house. Then he made those decisions, but he was still making horrible decisions because he had gotten so far into sin. He had gotten so far into the world's influence that even while the presence of God was there, he was making foolish decisions. But by the grace of God, we could be in the same exact place. 
So let's be careful before we judge Brother Lot. But let's be thankful that we're not there yet. Amen? And if you see yourself heading down that way, I would encourage you to repent right now. I would encourage you to seek God's face right now. Dear God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Dear God, be merciful to me. Help me to repent. Lord, bring me to repentance. You know, it's the goodness of God that draws us to repentance. It's his goodness and his goodness alone. It's not something inside of us that in our, in our own selves, in our own flesh, that says, well, I want to get right with God. It's God working in us. And I'm thankful for that. But we can sear the Holy Spirit. We can cut off that witness that he's trying to do in ourselves if we're not careful. And he can leave us to ourselves. And we can continue down that road of destruction and leading others to hell when we should be leading others to Christ. When we should be leading others to God. I'd ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, I, I shared with what you put on my heart. Lord, God, thank you for your long suffering in my life. Thankful for your mercy. Father, not one of us here deserves anything but hell tonight. Especially me. But Father, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. I thank you, Lord, that instead of giving me what I deserve, you extend grace to me. Lord, I pray tonight that you would work in our hearts. Lord, help us to be honest before you tonight, to examine ourselves. Not compare ourselves to Abraham or Lot, but help us compare ourselves to the Lord Jesus. He is our example. Dear Father, if there be any wickedness in us, Lord, would you help us to repent of it tonight? Lord, would you help us to call out to you and call upon you to cleanse us and to make us clean again? Father, thank you for the blood that was shed for our sins, my sin on the cross of Calvary. Thank you that you sacrificed your own son in my place because you love me so much. Father, help me to desire to live for you the way that I should. Father, I do want to glorify you. I do want to honor you. And Father, I pray that you would help me to keep my flesh at bay. Lord, I pray that your spirit would continue to move in my heart and the hearts of those that are listening tonight. Father, would you help us to quit going after selfish lusts would you help us, Father, to continue to seek your face? Lord, would you bring revival to us? Father, would you help us to be honest before you and not try to cover over things, but for, Lord, to, to get them out and confess them so that you can cleanse us, so that you can make us as though we didn't sin again. Lord, I know that you look at us through the blood of Christ, but Father, if we're going to be honest, we know that there are things that we need to bring before you and confess them to you so that you can help us, Lord, to live for you. Lord, I pray for Knoxville. I pray for the surrounding areas. I pray for our nation. We don't deserve your mercy, but, Lord, if you will, please extend more mercy to us. Help us as your people, as your church, Lord, to continue to be concerned about souls. Lord, help us not to look at the wicked and, and hope for the destruction of the wicked because, Father, you love them as well. Lord, help us to call out their names. Help us to beg for their souls and plead for their souls in prayer to you. But, Lord, help us also open our mouths and, and witness to them. Lord, the reason the world is the way it is today is because many have not even heard the truth. They've not heard about your son and what he has done. And so they're following those who have rejected you. They're following those who aren't living for you. But, Lord, I pray that you would burden our hearts that you would help us, Father, to be concerned about others besides ourselves. Dear God, help us to make an impact on this world. Lord, until you come, till you call us home, or till you blow the trumpet, Father, help us to be faithful. Lord, please continue to bless our pastor, put a hedge of protection around him. Lord, please continue to provide for his needs, and, and Lord, just help him, Father, to continue to lead this church in the way you see fit. Lord, we love you. I'm thankful for you, dear God. Lord, you deserve honor and glory. Lord, help me to live in such a way that brings you honor and glory. I ask this in Christ's name for his honor and glory. Amen.